one minute for this executive uh, webinar on being successful at managing multiple API management vendors and solutions in the large organization. So people are adding themselves to the uh, the webinar list. So yeah, in one minute we start officially the the webinar. If you have any questions, you have a chat section where actually you can ask questions to our panelists, uh, James Hinging Botham or Eric Wilde, uh, or myself, if you think I can uh, answer one of these. So don't hesitate to ask questions during the webinar. Question you may have about your current, uh, um, uh, your current, let's say, topics uh, or or the, the current let's say, issues you face on managing multiple API management solutions. So let's see each other in 30 seconds now. So we will start. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome for this uh, executive API webinar on um, on APIs and especially about how to be successful at managing multiple API management vendors and solutions in the law organiza organization. Uh, this webinar is brought to you by three partners. Uh, the first one is API Days Conferences. Uh, the second one is uh, API Scene Media Platform. And the third one is one of our partner uh, since 2012, which is uh, Axway. Uh, here. So uh, what we will talk about here is is really about um, uh, the different different topics on on managing. Uh, oh, sorry, just need to. Yeah, because we're not, I was not able to to click and change the uh, uh, the screen. Uh, so uh, oh, sorry for that again. I don't know what happens here. Okay. Now it works. Sorry for that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so uh, just to finish, sorry for uh, for, for this. So um, yeah, the, as the three partners are uh, are API Days, API Scene, and Axway. The, the first one is API Days conferences. So API Days conferences is a series of events organized organized in different cities and actually some of you may have been already participant of, of API Days uh, conferences uh, so far. It's a community of uh, 200,000 members uh, that, that organized more than uh, 50 uh, events, right? And that gave there the 25,000 past attendees. Uh, so if you are one of them, don't hesitate to tell them to tell it in, in the chat section. The second partner is epicene.io. It's the media platform uh, or for uh, API news and APIs article that's mostly, uh, that are mostly written by uh, the expert of the API industry uh, that comes to APIs conferences. So if you want any news, latest news on APIs as on the business side, but also on the technical side, don't hesitate to go on epicene.io. So what we will talk about today, uh, we'll talk about today about uh, the current topic, uh, uh, how to manage different API management solutions in organization, but answering a few specific questions that we'll try to, to discuss uh, with you all here. The first one will be maybe how to align every team and stakeholders engaged into APIs and adopting one solution to manage all these APIs, right? So that will be one of the first questions we can ask ourselves. The second one is like how to adopt group-wide solutions, you know, how to enable uh, teams to engage uh, enough to adopt like solutions that can be deployed at a group level, especially one question that uh, I really want to ask our panelists, how to start API projects with uh, solutions that enable to start easily, but how then to onboard other people to adopt these solutions. Uh, the third one that I think is extremely important is how to avoid team frustrations for already implemented solutions. Now you are the CIO wants the group solution and we have five, six teams that already implemented a, another vendor. How do you manage these frustration? How do, what's the level of discussion you need to have? And the last one is like what tooling and maybe what practices are available for having this smooth transition uh, uh, there. So we'll try to answer this solution. And for that, we have uh, two subject matter experts. So James Thinking Botham and Eric Wilde, and we will have a discussion all together uh, there. So I will invite uh, James 
uh, on a virtual stage, right? And so, James, if you can share your screen, tell a little bit more about where uh, you are, uh, where you come from, and let's go for some really nice stories about the topic. Great. Uh, thanks, Maddie. I uh, should be seeing my screen now. Uh, my name is James Higginbotham. I'm an API architect. I work with uh, organizations all around the world. I help them establish, grow, and mature their API programs. And uh, as Mehdi mentioned, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what happens when organizations have multiple API management vendors or multiple API management instances and things get really complex really quick. What are the different challenges and how do some of these organizations overcome these challenges. Uh, just a, a brief bit about myself, as I said, I'm an API architect. I'm based in Colorado Springs, and uh, I've worked across a number of different verticals. Uh, I've worked in uh, airline industry, travel, hospitality, finance and banking, commercial insurance, healthcare, and a number of others as well across my career. So what I wanna do is I wanna share three case studies. Uh, these three case studies will highlight three typical types of scenarios that I see in the field when I'm working with my clients. Um, the first one we're going to talk about is in the hospitality space. This is a worldwide hotel chain. They had an existing mobile app, web apps. They had their own internal systems, and they needed to connect up with partners and online travel agencies. So they have an entire ecosystem and supply chain that they have to manage and maintain. Now, traditionally, they've used things like a, a daily or hourly file-based batch data exchanges. They've used things like SOAP and uh, RPC in the past to be able to connect these systems together between these organizations. But over time, they started realizing that they needed to really uh, uh, transition and transform the way they do things and try to make things easier to onboard for their partners and to support all the digital channels that they were starting to work with to engage with the customers. They looked around for a commercial off the shelf solution and they couldn't find one. So they decided to build an in-house hospitality API platform around the existing systems they had by starting to build uh, REST-based APIs, hiding the legacy systems and eventually replacing them over time as they were able to. So if you wanna look at what this looked like, we have a web and mobile app originally and they had selected a gate API gateway vendor um, that uh, help them protect their back-end APIs, their mobile and web APIs, to power the front-end systems, digital channels, everything that they had, all the way down to the actual properties where people would uh, book a room or a series of rooms, conference rooms, and so on. As they started going down the hospitality API platform path, uh, they separately needed internal apps and partner connectivity. And so that particular team selected a separate vendor. Uh, they had uh, identified what made sense for the particular platform needs as opposed to the web and mobile API needs. So now we had two particular vendors, multiple instances of each, uh, each servicing the, both the mobile APIs and the platform APIs, but they were completely disconnected. Over time, they realized that uh, from the mobile APIs, they needed access to some of the platform APIs as they became mature and started to grow the offerings that they had. So they had to go back and have the mobile APIs reach through the initial gateway, allow the gateway to inject some of the credentials necessary to represent that particular user and connect to the second gateway vendor. They used that in turn to access some of the platform APIs. So they had to do a bit of transformation and conversion and adaption between the two, but it allowed each of the groups to operate independently. They didn't have to go back and tell the web and mobile team to change what they were doing or to tell the platform API team that they had to use the specific gateway chosen previously. They each were allowed to use what made sense for them, and then they built uh, an adapter in between. Now, of course, they had some challenges as a result of that. First of all, they had to do role and scope mapping, and that became a little bit more complex. How do we take the authorization roles and scopes that are assigned to a user in the mobile or web tier and map them into the platform tier? So there was work to be done there. They also had separate catalogs. In fact, most of the mobile APIs that existed were more like backend for front-end APIs. They were designed specifically for the applications that they were meant to service. Whereas the platform APIs were a little bit more general and they were meant to work uh, across a wider audience from those mobile and web users to partners and other kinds of integrations along their supply chain. 
So that made it a lot more difficult to find APIs. The platform API team had a central catalog for discovery. The mobile API team kind of knew in their head what they had because they were building for specific applications and not for reuse. So they established over time ways to be able to migrate their mobile APIs into their platform. Uh, but it made discovery a little bit difficult. They also had separate governance rules, limitations, uh, SLA rules, and uh, monitoring and reporting that were completely independent and separate. So they had to establish governance for the platform APIs first and then start to establish a process by which the mobile APIs could then be designed or redesigned to be consistent with the way the platform APIs worked and to work behind that separate API vendor. Onboarding was challenging as well. Platform APIs had a very uh, uh, systematic onboarding process for the mobile APIs. They were very specific to the applications. It was very difficult to get uh, new developers or new applications onboarded onto that system. It was very much just tailored for the mobile and web app uh, environments. The second case study I want to talk about is a global device and communication platform provider. Uh, they had a, a much different set of challenges. Uh, they have multiple products. They have devices that sit on premises. They have software that gets installed inside of data centers uh, and in the cloud. And they also had hosted software as a service solutions. So you can imagine their gateways were spread all over the place. They have internal APIs as well to power corporate IT for their workforce, for customer support systems, and for their third-party service providers. So theirs looked a much, much, much different. Uh, there were scripts, automation scripts and web apps that would connect to an edge gateway that would talk directly to the device. These edge gateways were installed on each device. And depending on the type of device, the product line, when it was released, those gateways varied considerably. They might have been... Uh, built in in some way, or they may have actually uh, been installed uh, with some sort of particular product consistently across the devices uh, as a separate thoughtful uh, process running uh, alongside the device. Uh, and that protected all the device APIs that existed, whether they were REST-based, uh, NetConf, RESTConf, GNMI, whatever the case may be. They also had a separate scenario for large organizations where they had uh, an edge gateway, but it was installed on a controller, and that controller was then uh, responsible for talking to each of the devices in turn. So the controller uh, pre presented one API to the organization for managing hundreds to thousands or more devices. So that was a different kind of gateway that they had to deal with, and that had to deal with different kinds of authorization and authentication scenarios that may be necessary for a large organization where you have teams of infrastructure and operations uh, members spread all over and they each had different responsibilities and different access controls. They also had their own uh, on-premises or data center uh, so installed software, their own internal software to support customer support APIs and operations APIs, so they had their own corporate gateway. Uh, and then they had their software as a service products with yet another kind of gateway that exposed the product APIs themselves. So their challenges were many. Uh, they had the same kind of role and scope mapping, but it extended across devices, across controllers, across different product lines that were built in-house or acquired. They had onboarding difficulties because each uh, uh, device or each gateway for each device or controller or product oftentimes had different types of authentication schemes that were supported. Some were username password, some were token based, some had OAuth two legged, OAuth three legged. There were all sorts of different scenarios that required them to support a number of different uh, uh, onboarding processes for the developers. Uh, so they also had governance limitations. Each one of these product lines has their own business unit, their own dedicated set of uh, style guides and um, uh, approaches to design and patterns that they apply. So they had to take on a, a much larger process of organizing and getting buy-in from all these different groups to start to create more consistency across all of these areas. However, GDPR and other kinds of regulations would limit the amount of central management or central control plane management that they could have because of all of the specific details you might have, like IP addresses and, and so on, usernames and so on that exist across all these devices, uh, there, there were severe limitations of being able to coalesce these into a single cloud-based solution. So we had to come up with some consistency and some different ways to 
uh, manage this and make this a little bit more amenable for each group while um, allowing each group to work autonomously and respecting the, uh, the, the rights and regulations of, of data management and personally identifiable information. So we'll talk about how they did that in just a bit. The last case study is a large US bank. Uh, they have about 10,000 plus developers, over 2,500 uh, independent uh, scrum teams. They have multiple lines of business, regulatory audit requirements. Uh, they have to appear externally and internally as a single platform for mobile and web users so that everything works within a single mobile or web app. They can manage all of their different accounts and so on. So they had web and mobile applications and they had different gateway instances to do this. They had a public instance uh, that talked to their platform APIs. This allowed for the typical authentication authorization flows, as well as, as uh, account information and everything else. Then they had a public PCI compliant instance that allowed them to segment some of the API calls that dealt with any kind of PCI compliance with regard to managing uh, uh, bank accounts and transactions and, and other details so that they could ease their audit uh, challenges. They have internal apps, so that had its own gateway instance that allowed internal applications to communicate with the platform. Each of these gateways limited the surface area of the overall platform to whatever made the most sense for that. They also wanted to regulate uh, third-party APIs, so all their outbound traffic went through a gateway instance that would manage centralized API tokens for third-party APIs and would also monitor and manage each team's usage of those APIs so that they could manage cost effectively the uh, licensing requirements for those APIs and API call usage. Then as they transitioned to the cloud over the last few years, they started using cloud API gateways in addition. So they had their own internal gateway that they had deployed for all these instances built on Nginx, but now they had to start dealing with additional gateway instances to support things like um, serverless functions and, and other kinds of capabilities available into the cloud. Uh, so that brought in a lot of challenges. One, they had built their own in-house gateway, uh, and they're slowly slipping behind further and further from what a lot of the uh, commercial and open source API management vendors are offering, uh, simply because uh, the business will always trump internal development for an infrastructure component. So they, their gateway works, it works well, it solved a problem uh, years ago, when they first started uh, building these API, this API platform about seven years ago, the number of vendors available and the features that they offered weren't sufficient enough for what they needed, so they started building things internally. But they've now been passed up a lot of the commercial vendors. Uh, so they're, they're dealing with that challenge alone. They're also challenged with uh, blending the cloud gateway and the in-house gateway. So we see uh, some similar kinds of role mapping and, and security concerns that we would have. Uh, their investment uh, had to be built, therefore, to handle all these different instances in the automatic deployment, their CI CD pipelines. They invested a considerable amount of work making sure that as an API was onboarded into the platform, that the, um, the appropriate scopes and roles were identified. The instance gateway instances that they need to be deployed to were identified and tagged appropriately during the design phase before everything was deployed so that it would be onboarded into the right gateway. We don't want a PCI compliant API onboarded onto the public gateway and start leaking uh, very sensitive APIs. So they wanted to make sure of that. So they spent a considerable amount of effort automating that process to make sure every API was onboarded into the correct gateway and, and so on. So we have these three case studies. What were some of the strategies they used to, to handle these multiple vendors? Uh, in multiple instances. One, they unified their API catalog. Uh, the ones that were really successful about this either designed their own API catalog that helped support their deployment processes across different gateways or across different tiers, or they found an off-the-shelf catalog solution that allowed them to have a single point of discovery, a single point of onboarding to developers while hiding behind the scenes multiple API management vendors and how all of that uh, token um, uh, registration or the the application registration and the token provisioning uh, worked uh, it it created this illusion of a single location where to find apis and where to register and onboard we didn't have to go find the person in another building in another group in another country perhaps that was responsible for a particular gateway that you were interested in using. It helped us also have a full catalog of our a API capabilities and find where we had overlapping or complementary capabilities even if they were deployed across different 
gateway solutions. Uh, the second thing they did is they applied federated governance. This ensured consistency uh, by having a single group define design patterns and standards and practices. Uh, they helped become the glue across all the different groups within the organization that manages CICD to, to uh, development patterns and practices and libraries that, that were considered uh, more effective or more efficient, um, you know, code generators and other things like that so that it all kind of cohesively comes together. The central group managed those cross-cutting concerns, but then they federated out with these API coaches to individual business units or lines of business. This allowed them to apply contextually the things that the uh, that particular business unit or line of business knew was necessary to conduct day-to-day -day business. Uh, they didn't have one central ivory tower group of people that didn't know how a particular part of the organization functioned. Instead, they listened to those federated coaches. They heard what was working and what wasn't, and they made adjustments centrally and then shared that out. So it allowed them to share the load but also to distribute decision-making, even down to the API management vendor selection, if they wanted to allow that kind of freedom and flexibility. The third thing they did is they unified their tracing and their security models. I'd mentioned earlier that a lot of these organizations have had to do OAuth scope rules and uh, different kinds of authorization mapping. So they did that. One organization that I worked with actually used the open API specification extensions by doing the X dash naming convention for a key. And for each operation, they did like something similar to what my example here on the screen is X scope mappings. And it allowed them to map what global scope existed and what smaller uh, local scope existed on their gateway to provide some sort of transparent negotiation between the role mappings. So if someone has a particular scope mapping uh, from uh, that, that's identified globally, this was the scope name that may have been around for years that was the equivalent and allowed them to do that kind of mapping. They also inserted correlation IDs in every quest as it goes through so that as you go across API gateway boundaries, if your calls cross those boundaries, you had correlation IDs for troubleshooting, you knew where things were coming from, and you had scope mappings to help you bridge across those boundaries as well. So that's three case studies of what I've seen in the field. Hopefully that'll get our discussion kicked off uh, nicely. Um, these are some of the strategies that we've seen, and we're going to talk about a few more. Uh, this is my contact information before we jump into the, the Q&A session. Uh, make sure you sign up for our newsletter as well, apideveloperweekly.com. Uh, we just keep you updated on all kinds of news and events that are going on. Uh, right now, I'm going to turn it back to Mehdi, and we're going to have a great discussion with me and Eric and Mehdi. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you, James, for uh, these uh, three examples uh, and also for your conclusion. So I will ask uh, Eric, uh, uh, who is with, uh, with us today, uh, like Eric, you, you, you've you been in this space for a long time. You, you've seen many companies. You also talk often about governance, right, on the governance aspect. Uh, about API, so uh, yeah, what's what's your uh, point of view? What uh, on what James shared? If Eric, are you able? If you're able. Ha, unmuted. Okay, good. Um, so first of all, yeah, uh, hello, Mary, and <laughs> thanks, James, for this uh, really really nice introduction and overview of things you've encountered. And uh, of course, you're right, Mary. I mean, I've seen uh, lots of these things happening. So very brief introduction about myself. My name is Eric Bille. I used to travel a lot to all kinds of API events, of course, including lots of API days. I'm very sorry, Maddie, that this is not an API days stage here, but uh, it was kind of the nicest picture I had. Since um, we've changed our mode of operation a little bit now, actually, I put quite a bit of energy into producing videos. If you want to check out my videos, please go ahead. Um, I'm trying to turn that into a medium where also people can discuss, exchange ideas, talk about things and so forth. So that's what I'm doing more nowadays uh, in terms of putting energy into media, so to speak. And where I work is I work for X-Way. We're in a small team called the Catalysts. Um, it's a small group, there's seven of us. And our mission pretty much really is just to help customers to make good decisions in the API space, pretty much. That's, that's, that's about it. So we don't really talk about products. We have many other experts that can do that. So we really try to help 
organizations and teams to make good decisions when it comes to using APIs to improve things and whatever these things are, we try to help them with it or we try to also point to other things that maybe also could be improved. So that's just a little bit about myself as an introduction. I'll stop the slideshow here. A little bit about my background in this whole story. So we are a software company and we are selling an API gateway and a portal and all the usual, let's say, API infrastructure things. And what we've, of course, observed, I, I'm sure as all the other vendors have as well, that in many cases when you come to organizations, it's not that they don't have anything in place. So in many places you will actually find uh, some kind of setting where an organization already has something and James already walked us through a couple of really good examples and he also walked us through some of the things that needed to be done and how they were done. And I think that really is a very valuable lesson in terms of this kind of contrast between, well, ideally you have all your APIs coming into existence at some point, you all put them to the same gateway and you manage them in the same portal and very high, often that is just not happening. And like I said, we observed that with many organizations that we talked to. So what we did is we started looking into why that is the case. And I have, I have pasted two links into the chat if you want to check them out. So one is about a white paper that we wrote about that I will just talk about in a second. And the other one is a little teaser video basically for this white paper that just walks you a little bit through what the white paper does. But I'll, I'll do that here too. So what we did is we wrote the white paper by talking to a number of customers who had more than one gateway in place, so who had this a little bit more complex infrastructure, and we tried to find out two things. We tried to find out why did that happen, and we also tried to find out why is that problematic. So what, what are the things that you see happening that are not great? And I would like to share with you very briefly, and again, if you would like to learn more, you're more than welcome to download and read the white paper where it's all detailed also with some case studies. But I would like to walk you briefly through our general findings. So we found six main reasons why companies have multiple gateways in their infrastructure. And I would like to walk you through those six reasons very briefly. So number one is the difference in infrastructure when it comes to external and internal API traffic. That is something that you see fairly often where organizations are having APIs that they expose to partners of the public and they also have APIs that they use privately and these are just managed in different ways. And sometimes that is also because historically the way these things were handled are different teams and they all came up with their own infrastructure. So in the end, often the reason why you have external and internal API traffic being handled differently is rooted in organizational reasons or in reasons who decided that this should be done and who then actually put infrastructure in place. Let's look at the second reason why we have multiple gateways. The second reason is deployment. So in many cases, organizations nowadays have non-trivial deployment patterns. So they have on-premises solutions, they have cloud solutions, they might have cloud solutions in multiple clouds, or they have hybrid things where they have on-premise and clouds or multiple clouds being mixed. And in that case, you often also end up with having your API gateway chosen for you almost by default, because for example, it is part of a certain cloud offering, so you go with that. Or you have a certain software solution that you using that you're using, and then that also may come with a gateway as part of it, or as a very closely affiliated thing with it. So you go with that, and that again is is just something that happens because often these things come into existence as a side effect of, of other activities. So you end up with these 
deployment models and how gateways came into existence in different places or associated with different software solutions. And again, you have more than one gateway. That was reason number two. Reason number three sometimes is that organizations specifically want to allow governance to be decentralized. So they specifically say, we don't want to create one centralized solution. That is particularly something that you see in pretty large organizations happening, where it becomes clear that probably that would slow things down a lot. So they want to have a decentralized way of allowing people to publish and manage APIs. And that is probably not a bad idea. But again, if you do that, you end up with multiple API gateways. That was reason number three. Reason number four is the fact that sometimes you have a gateway in place and then you realize that something that you want to do is not supported by that gateway. And then you may bring in another gateway just to close that functionality gap because you have some API where you really need some functionality and your gateway isn't doing it or isn't doing it in the way you want it to do that. So you plug that hole basically by bringing in another gateway that fulfills your requirements. So that's reason number four, functionality gaps. Reason number five are um, different production stages. So you might have a development environment, you might have a testing environment, you might have staging environments, you might have production environments, and all of these might be really different environments and they might have different infrastructure associated with them. They might even be managed by different teams. And again, that may lead to the situation where you do have multiple API gateways because you brought up these different environments and they just came into being in a different way and they have different infrastructures. That was reason number five. Reason number six is the last reason that we found which is microservices versus monoliths. And in that case, what happens is that organizations that break away from rather monolithic architectures where everything is just managed in one large code base and now they start breaking parts off of that and trying to move those into microservices and manage them in a different way, sometimes that may result in these microservices then also being managed by different teams, developed by different teams, running in different environments. And again, that kind of breaking up a monolithic structure and introducing these APIs and then having the need to manage all these APIs that you have introduced may also mean that you end up with different API gateways. So those were the six reasons. Summarize external versus internal, deployment models, number three, Governance differences, number four, the question of different uh, of functionality gaps, number five, different ways how you run environments, and number six, microservices rules, monoliths. This is a, a fairly, I would say, a fairly rich set of reasons that you, you can find. So you have a lot of organizations where this happens. And, and one of the things that you would like to to uh, say is that don't be, don't think that you did something wrong when you have this. It's really in large organizations, it's relatively normal. I think it's just the complexity of these organizations and the infrastructure that they build over time. It's just naturally not something that is very simple, top down, and, and the simplest possible structure you can find. So it's really not something that I think is a sign of something that went wrong. It's just that it happened. <laughs> it happens to a lot of organizations. So the first thing we did was we looked at these reasons. The second thing we did was we asked the organizations where this happened, what were the challenges that you encountered? And once again, James already ran us through some specific challenges that he saw with customers and, and what they did about it. And what I would like to spend just another few minutes with is to run you through the challenges that we found in our study. And again, if you want to read more about it, feel free to download and read the white paper. I'll just give you a brief introduction. 
So we found four main challenges. Number, challenge number one that we found was governance and security. So that really means that if you have all these APIs and now they get published in different places, how do you make sure that you can you have some control over them, whatever level of control that you want to have, so that you can actually make that control happen? And then the other question is how you can make sure, how you can can you make sure that your security requirements are actually followed for all those APIs? And that of course is a relatively significant challenge. And I think that is something that I also saw in some of James' examples. Challenge number two that is arising from these multi-gateway environments is consumption visibility. So it's the question of how do I even know which APIs I have and how they are consumed so that I can better understand which APIs are how popular and how important so that I can, for example, better, better think about investments and, and infrastructure and all these kind of things. That can, can become relatively complicated when all these APIs are getting consumed in different places and there is no consolidated place where you can find out how this consumption compares. So you're not really having the full picture of what happens with your APIs, and that can be a little bit frustrating in particular when you, make, when you want to make some decisions going forward. Challenge number three that we found was just some economic things where you can say, if we have those things, then maybe we're paying more money than we have to because we're having, we're probably paying for different solutions that we're using. Maybe if we consolidated them, we could save money on, on, those, on those expenses for the infrastructure. Can also mean that it's just the duplication of effort that you have to go through in these different places where you have to, to do certain things here and then you have to do them again here and do them again there because you have multiple places where this needs to be done. And maybe it even needs to be done in slightly different ways because these are different products. So every time, even though you're trying to do the same thing, you have to do it in a different way and that leads to extra effort, which is some a form of expense. And the other thing is also that it makes it harder to easily reuse things. In an ideal world, if everything was centralized, it would be, you would easier get into these scenarios of economies of scale, where you would say, if we all consolidate things into one place, then we can probably scale things in a more economical way. So these are some of the challenges that we've, we've seen with those economic trade-offs where some economic fundamentals might not be what you want them to be. So that's challenge number three. And challenge number four that we heard about was debugging and monitoring. So the again, something that James was mentioning already. So this question, for example, that if we have all these different APIs, and now something is not going as we want it to go, how do we even find out what's happening? So for example, if calls, and I think James also had some examples there, if calls go through multiple API gateways, right? How can I even, how can I make sure that I can actually associate those different calls and then trace them and figure out where things are going wrong? So I think that's another example where it's, also a question of visibility, it's just a different one. So one that I said that we have is, we're having a, a visibility of consumption and here we're having visibility basically for debugging and monitoring. Okay, and that is everything that I wanted to present, so to speak, just walk you a little bit through that white paper. Once again, it's something that you can read through if, if you're interested in. And that was our way how we found out a little bit about how clients are getting into the situation and what they see as the challenges. Now, being a software company, of course, for us, that also means that this is good input for us to think about how we are planning to improve, to evolve our product. And we are already going in that direction by allowing 
multiple gateways to be visible in one place. Um, so that's something that, that hopefully people find useful. And I think that the things that James was already sharing with us are a good indication that, that there, there are things that you need to do when you have this situation. And the question then as well, is it something you need to build? Or is it something that ideally right, you, you could get out of some products with probably some configuration, but without the need to really custom build all these things? So I'd like to stop here, sort of my presentation part. But one thing I would like to start the, the discussion with, actually, if, if I can have the freedom to do that, Maddie, is I, I would like to ask James, you know, just, just as a spontaneous response, would you think that the things that you created, that it would have been easy to solve these problems kind of with products? Or would you think that there were so many intricate problems that had to be solved and so many you know, little bits and pieces here and there that in the end, basically, it, it is a lot of handwork and in the end, you really need to build those things and, and it's maybe hard to really come up with a product that just makes it relatively easy. Yeah, I think, I think some organizations right now are starting to experience some of these pain points that we're talking about today. Some of them that have been on the API journey for a while have experienced it years ago, and there wasn't really an off-the-shelf solution. Um, I think also a lot of it, it comes to do with the uh, organizational structure. Uh, you had mentioned that as one of the primary drivers that you identified in the white paper. Uh, the structure has a lot to do with it. It creates processes. It also determines, uh, are you a departmentalized organization where you have separate uh, business units or products, or are you centrally managed and functionally structured to where you have a kind of a natural reporting structure and you can somewhat take control of the centralized approach? And if it's a centralized organization, then they may start to discover those things early and they then start looking across the market and see if anything is there to help them and maybe they can buy something off the shelf. And we're seeing that starting to emerge now uh, with Axway and other, other vendors starting to kind of recognize this problem and starting to come to bear with a product. Other organizations that we are early on or have very specific needs that just don't match off the shelf solutions have, have had to build their own. But those drivers have a big impact on it as well as when you started your API journey, definitely. Does it answer your question, Eric? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're, you're on mute, Eric. I think ah, muted myself again. Uh, yeah, no, that yeah. Thank you. It does. So I have a I have a question because you showed that there are so many so many different gateways that could be implemented different depending on the different let's say technical strategies that you are adopting internal external centralized uh, 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 more federated and and other um, uh, patterns. But there is also the brand that's associated with it, right? You know. And, and as I was saying in, in the early question of the webinar, mo a lot of uh, people are actually facing a governance versus, uh, uh, let's say, uh, adoption issues where uh, the CEO adopts a group solution and many, many gateways are already in place from sometimes different vendors, right? And now there's a weird discussion that happens about like, yeah, we need to adopt a group solution, but we already made all these projects that are working. And yes, so I don't know for you, Eric or, or James, who wants to start with, but how do you help and how do you, how do you help like teams to handle this discussion? Yeah, I, I, I can pitch in a little bit. So it's definitely, I think one of the big questions that you hear a lot, yes, you're definitely right with that. So I think one of the problems there that you see is that you really have to think about what you're, what you're, kind of doing there, right? Where on the one hand, you have all these teams that you try to empower a little bit and make them a little bit more autonomous by, by going to APIs and say, well, you can, you can build it in any way you like as long as you have an API. And, that, and sometimes that can be a very powerful thing to do where you grant more autonomy to the teams. But then again, when you start putting more constraints on how they actually deploy those 
and, and what it takes to actually get their API published, which sometimes also can be non-trivial, then that's, I think, uh, where it, it's really, it's, it's kind of a delicate balance between how much are you actually now holding them back again by trying to centralize that part or how much can you avoid doing that by saying, well, there are certain constraints, that's usually my recommendation. What I, where I say, make clear what you want to achieve. So define the constraints where you, why you think that an API gateway is necessary, why it needs to be there, what you want from it. And then provide that as a service, but also provide the ability for teams to say, that's fine, but we're good here. We, we have something else. And that may, in particular, when it comes to security, that may become a non-trivial negotiation, so to speak. But I think it's something where at least you can kind of balance that idea of, on the one hand, say, saying you need, to, you need to have some constraints for regulatory and security reasons, whatever. But you also want to give teams who have a good reason to say, it's fine, but we still want to do our own stuff just tell us what we need to get done, that you allow them to do that. And the exact process that you have in place for this, I think that's the hard part always. But I think that at least having that process and being that a conscious decision that is being made, I think that is something that allows you to better find that balance between now going back to centralization again or allowing teams that autonomy also on the gateway level. James, do the solution you propose at the end of your talk, like the three solutions, a unified catalog, a federation, and, uh, and I don't remember the other one, but uh, uh, are these three like would, would work in this case of uh, in this discussion? Yeah, so, so I think there's a few different things that you have to keep in mind. Um, one is the, as you had mentioned or alluded to, the brand. So are the are allowing us to fragment our vendor solutions improving or degrading the quality of the brand are we exposing ourselves to a security risk that could negatively impact our customers our partners and and therefore our brand as a result so as eric mentioned having some constraints around that makes sense uh, and and that then in turn will help you drive kind of how you're approaching that federated model how much control are you giving down to the edge of the organization where decisions are being made? Uh, I've seen uh, some of the organizations that are more uh, departmentalized where they have separate business units, they are suffering now with some poor developer experiences because what used to be these segmented personas that each product sort of catered to, they're blending now. Uh, the automation and programmatic capabilities of APIs are starting to cause people to start having cross-cutting concerns. So they start working with one API and it doesn't work the same as the other, or you know things are they, things are, are struggling. So things like the unified catalog help to present a single presence out as a brand, even if you have different departmentalized groups using different gateways and and trying to achieve closer consistency across each other than say a more uh, centralized functional structure where you everything rolls up and there's checks and balances and, and, and gateways and so on or, or you know, checkpoints along the way to make sure that things are consistent. And, and we try to use things like the tracing and security mapping and uh, unified catalogs and so on to kind of bridge that gap. But it really comes down to, I think, a developer experience, a branding experience as well as to what you're presenting. And if there's an advantage to your organization to be able to move quickly and, and push some of those decisions down to the edge, or if they've done, that's been done in the past, then it's time for the organization to come back and rethink. We don't want ultimate centralized control because we know that is really, really painful to the organization's velocity overall. We do want some autonomy down at the edge, but we need to figure out how we do that to retain developer experience and consistency without damaging the brand and introducing uh, security events in the future uh, that, that, could, that could crop up. So just a reminder for all participants, if you have any questions, you can ask them in the chat, uh, right? Uh, we are also here to answer uh, your questions, so don't, don't hesitate to, to type them in. Uh, also a question about like, uh, uh, you know, in the vendor discussion, 
uh, when when it's about like a, a specific contract for a specific company, uh, do you see that sometimes um, uh, that vendor works better with other vendor in place than other? Do you see kind of uh, uh, some some solutions that are more fit to be open to others compared to other ones which are kind of closed and it's you have to adopt them all or nothing? Uh, what, what's your what's your experience in this? Um, yeah, so I can I can jump in on that. So a lot of what I see, uh, which is really interesting, is that some of the cloud vendors that offer gateway solutions uh, really get aggressive in trying to uh, sell their their particular gateway and to get the entire solution in there. So they're they're the cost side of things. There's a lot of cost benefit to doing that. Um, so it's really comes down to what the the appropriate feature set is that's offered by that. But I, I see a lot of aggressive sales tactics as a result of that, which incentivizes organizations to stay with one particular vendor over time, um, whether it be a cloud vendor that has acquired a solution or if it's a cloud vendor that's built their own. Um, and, but what I have seen from the clients, most of my clients will actually spend a lot of time doing a, a, a bake off between all of them and make sure that they're selecting the right one. They realize that an infrastructure decision like that's pretty critical. So the, the, while the, uh, the cost structures can, can have an impact, they're looking at it from a execution standpoint as well. Can, can we do everything we need to do? And they'll bring in their enterprise architects or solution architects and, and get some real world field advice to make sure that they're getting the right thing. Yeah, well, I mean, of course, you know, speaking speaking for a software vendor, right? So, uh, of course, I'm opinionated here. But I think, I mean, you can just tell, and in part, I think you can just tell from what James already alluded to, right? Like, who, what, what are the what are the interests that are clearly associated with a particular vendor? And I think often you will see that those interests do influence the way they design and package things. That's and that's just, I think, that's just nature. <laughs> that just happens. And um, of course, what we're trying to sell, being being kind of the the only vendor that doesn't have that, our unique value proposition is to say, well, we don't have that conflict of interest. That's kind of one of the things that we're saying, and I think that is that is at least a good pitch. So people like hearing that because it it is something that resonates. And what I try to reinforce with people when we talk to them is to ask them. Even if you make that change now or make that decision now to, let's say, go to a certain cloud vendor that, you know, if that is okay for you, it works out right now, what's the cost of change? And I think that is always something that, in particular, when you're a little bit higher up in the chain and you need to make these strategic decisions, I think it really is an important thing to keep in mind that even though this might be right now, you know, it ticks the right boxes, but... I think in particular, when you start thinking about how quickly organizations evolve nowadays, how quickly they might bring in new solutions, they might even bring in new companies that they acquire. So, so the requirements might change pretty quickly. And then the question is, if at some point now you have to reassess the decision that you made, how hard would it be to change from the one vendor that you pick to a different one? Or is that something that you can do relatively fluidly? Because you said, we don't want to be only with one vendor and we don't want to make that decision understanding that it's really, really hard to go away from that decision. And I think that is something that sometimes takes a little longer to explain, but I think it's something that people often find an interesting thought where they say, oh, that's actually an interesting thing to keep in mind that even though maybe now we want to consolidate things or it works fine for us, one, two, three, four years from now, this may change and the smoother we can actually make that transition and then decide on the best product that we want to use and not say, well, we would like to use this, but we can't because it's super expensive to switch everything around. Then I think things might look a little different from time to time. Yeah. I, I see that a lot too in the in the uh, the the cost of change. I see that with uh, organizations that have adopted a solution because they had an existing vendor, so procurement's much easier. 
the friction oftentimes is much easier to say, well, we already have a relationship. We can set up a, a, a PO and, uh, and, and get this vendor onboarded pretty quickly. Um, we don't have to vet a new company. They've already been vetted and so on. But the downside of that that I've seen with organizations sometimes is that by doing that, uh, sometimes those vendors are just me too vendors and they have a very great product that was originally adopted and they go, oh yeah, we, we do API management as well. And they're really just kind of shadowing everybody else and kind of throwing something out to, to, to take opportunity of the easier procurement and easier decision-making process. But it will leave organizations in a point where they end up having to adopt another vendor because they didn't go with the one that, that really fit uh, their not only immediate needs, but future needs. They also went with someone who's following, not leading and not investing heavily in the API management solution. It's just there to, to, to take a box. So uh, that can really lead to a very fragmented organization result. So that change management or the change cost, you need to weigh in. Are they really leading the pack with API management solutions or are they just a me too? And they're eventually going to fall behind and you're going to have to change again later and incur another cost. So uh, I've seen that. I work with a lot of different API vendors and they all have their strengths and weaknesses and weighing those things out and determining what the long-term cost is and what the roadmap that vendor has for that API management layer is really important because it tells you, are they going to be with you as a partner all the way down the line? Or are they just giving you a deep discount now to kind of get you, get you hooked in? And, uh, and, and there's, and there's different, different API management solutions that fit everybody. So there's no one size fit all for, so making sure you count those costs ahead of time is really key. So it seems there's architecture decisions, there are governance ability of ab governance abilities, ability to deliver uh, change, uh, procurement processes, uh, vendor, let's say, uh, uh, vendor uh, baits uh, or, or techniques uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to get you. Uh, there are many, many variables, right, to align the API management solutions with the current API programs there. Uh, um, yeah, we, we wanted to keep it short, but actually we finally, uh, uh, <laughs> finally uh, spent like the whole hour uh, discussing on the topic. Uh, again, it's maybe the last last uh, chance to have any question from the panelists, but waiting for that. Uh